Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. When I was preparing this series that we're in the middle of called More Than Me, I went, I really, I cannot do a whole series about friendship myself because I'm not good enough at friendship to do a whole series about this as my, by myself. Um, I have too much to learn and do this wrong too many times. Uh, and so I was thinking through and praying through who in this church carries friendship in a healthy, powerful way that has something to give to us as a church family. And top of my list was Liz Zambonini. And, uh, and so I put her in on the church suite uh, rota because she'd gone on holiday. And so I thought, well, I could put her in. That puts my mind at rest. Uh, and then when she gets back, I can make sure I ask her before she gets on the rotor and then she went on the rotor and saw her name against it without having been asked and panicked I was like oh no I've got to do something and I don't know what I've got to do so um sorry Liz I learned my lesson but genuinely uh it's been a joy to get to know Liz far better over the last two years as she's been on staff with us and the way she handles friendship the insight she has the things she's learned from God and the things she's learned through her life uh, the friend she is to many of us is truly exemplary. And so I want you to um, get on the edge of your seat, ready to learn from this lady this morning. Why don't you come on up, Liz? Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. I'm looking at Beth because <laughs> as an example of... of of friendship. <laughs> I was having a bit of trouble this morning trying to get this to work and, you know, navigate it between hair and everything else as a girl. And so I ran into the toilet now two minutes ago and I was like, I can't get this to work. And then luckily I saw Bess in there and I was like, Beth, you are just the person I need. And she explained to me I had it on the wrong way around. That was my problem. Sometimes we need friends to point things out to us. <laughs> so, um, as, as Adam has illustrated so well over the last couple of weeks, uh, friendship is valuable and, Im- and an important gift from God. And we see examples of this throughout the Bible. Um, everything from, you know, the close friendship between like David and Jonathan, Ruth and Naomi. We see it with Jesus, with his 12 disciples, with his inner three or four um, in his broader circles, with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Um, and... Um, we also have um, looked at how this is backed up um, in, in the world with um, science and research. So we know that there's been a lot of research done into health and well-being and how important friendships are in our, in our everyday health and well-being. And I, some of you might know about um, a Harvard um, research paper that's been running for, I think it's 85 years. It started in 1938. I haven't checked the maths on this. But um, it is... Now, I know Adam will be so fast on this, <laughs> but, but um, this study was looking at what makes people happy. And uh, so they, they started off with the first group, and they've looked at their children and their grandchildren over this course of time. And the big conclusion, um, looking at everything on this, is that close relationships, more than money or fame, are what keep people happy throughout their lives. Those ties protect people from life's discontents, help to delay mental and physical decline, and are better predictors of long and happy lives than social class, IQ, or even genes. I thought that was really powerful. And I've seen a lot on social media lately about these types of studies that have been done. Um, And uh, in fact, one of the conclusions on this was that they said, um, if they look at the relationships that people have in place by the age of 50, they will be able to predict how their health and well-being will be at 80. Yeah, so, so my kids said, well, you better get on, get on with it then, Mom. <laughs> anyway, um, so this morning, I wanna, we want to look at delving a bit deeper. I know, I know. Lovely, aren't they? <laughs> um, where are we at with friends? You've had a couple of weeks now to really get into this, and, and Adam showed us Dunbar's circles of friendships. And I just want to take a moment now, um, because we're going to look at with, um, what, where are we at? Um, and so you look at, for those of you who might not remember this, um, Dunbar did some research into this and looked at how 
most of us have friends. Now, don't get too hung up on the exact numbers, but ideally you want to have a couple of people at least in each circle, and they should get bigger as, this, as, as you go out. So in your most intimate friendships and relationships would be one or two people. Then there'd be four or five people who um, are your very, very close friends, 15 who are good friends um, that you would maybe see once a month, um, and then 50 who you would say are just friends, and 150 who are friends, maybe you see them at church, that type of thing, and then there's 500 acquaintances, and, and so it goes on. Um, so just take a moment now to look at and imagine in your head your circles, and, and where do you think you might want to uh, focus your attention? Um, just look at it now with the Lord as well, and just, just let him point out to you, you know, is it that you need one or two more close friends, really, really close friends? Or maybe you've got a couple of close friends, but you actually need to just make some friends to have fun with. Friends that you could go to a movie with, play a football game with, something like that. Um, so I'm going to give you a minute, um, and, and then we're going to delve into um, how do we actually make friends. Gives me a chance to have a sip of water as well. So, the starting point of making friends is being a good friend. Um, a relationship that is based on what you can get out of it is unlikely to last the course. The basis of any friendship is love. And Jesus taught us this, it's throughout the Bible but he told us to love others as we love ourselves. And um, so if we go in with the motivation of love, of seeing people the way God sees them, as valuable, precious, um, his children, who he loves as much as he loves you, I found that much easier than to accept everything about people and go in looking for the gold in that person. Um, I think of it also as, you know how when you're like a good friend's children, those children, you start to become more, you start to, you know, you'll look at the photos, you'll actually look at their video, which they send you of them singing in the musical, because those children have become precious to you because your friend is precious to you, and they are precious to your friend. And so those children have become precious to you. And so in the same way, um, looking around at the people around us, those are God's children, and they are precious to him. And so they need to become precious to us. If we, um, if we turn now in our Bibles to uh, Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, it's a chapter that's often read at weddings, but it's just as important in all kinds of friendships. Um, and it says, um, verse 13, if I speak, um, oh, sorry, verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So what Paul is saying here is that we can have all the gifts. We can do amazing things for the Lord. Um, but if we don't have love, we don't have anything. And he, uh, and he goes on to explain what love is. And I think we can substitute the word love or friendship in this. And we can say that um, a, a friend, a friend is patient, a friend is kind, a friend is not envious, a friend is not boastful or proud. Friends don't dishonor others. They see the best in each other. They encourage one another. They recognize and call out the gifting in each other. A friend is not self-seeking. A friend is not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. A friend wants the best for each other and delights in God's truth and blessing in the other person's life. Friends protect each other, they are trustworthy, and they choose to trust each other. A friend hopes and prays for the best for their friend, a 
and stays the course. You know, sometimes friendship involves sacrifice where we need to put the other person's needs first. And I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't have boundaries and, and look after ourselves as well. But um, in the current culture that we live in, I think sometimes we've swung a little bit too much to the side where we, where we have lost the idea of sacrifice and giving um, and serving one another. And Phil Knox says um, in his book on friendship, looking after ourselves is important. There is a truth at the heart of the great commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. To give the best of ourselves, we need to love others well. But in a world where self-help book, self books monumentally outnumber books about helping others, the pendulum has swung towards therapeutic individualism over sacrificial friendship. So it's love, if both are important, loving ourselves and loving others. Neither one takes priority. And just to give an example from my own life, so I've got a really good friend, Maz, um, who I often mention. And um, so <laughs> those who know me are laughing because um, I think they feel like they know her already. That's why. <laughs> um, so back um, a, a few years ago, in, or quite a few years ago now, when I was living in Johannesburg, um, Paolo was in Dubai and we were, um, and I went to go and visit my family over Christmas and I had a nine-month-old, a three-year-old, and a five-year-old. And I had to fly back from Cape Town to Johannesburg, which is a two-hour flight, which sounds like, okay, a two-hour flight. But anyone who's traveled with children will know what that actually entails. Prams, baby bags, you carrying the nine-month-old, and Luca was um, huge. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, but lovely now. And, uh, <laughs> but, and then I had the three-year-old and the five-year-old, and I had to try and keep them occupied for the two hours before we boarded the flight. This is before iPads were invented. Okay, that's how long ago. You don't know how easy you have it now that you have technology. <laughs> so um, I had to keep them all occupied. I used to at those times have to wrap up little gifts and things. So I had all these activities and one of my children's attention span was about 30 seconds to two minutes. So we had, to, I mean, I, I can tell you everything on a flight. I mean, I, we used to read that you know, the safety, that was just one of our activities, reading the safety booklet, <laughs> um, opening down the tray, closing the tray, opening the tray, closing the tray, very exciting. Anyway, we are on the flight, it, was, it, was, it took about six hours, including having to change a nappy with all three children in the toilet on the airplane. Okay, so by the time I got to the other side, I was completely frazzled. I could still get home. I hadn't been in the house for two weeks, so there was nothing in the house. And my friend Maz phoned me and said, listen, what time are you arriving back? Um, I've made you a meal. I'm coming over to help you settle in. And she drove across town. She met me. Um, and I was just so grateful. She had bread and milk. She had food. She had made a meal for the kids. She had a meal for me. She had a glass of wine for me as well. <laughs> and she, she, it just took all this. I was frenzied. And it just all dissipated. Um, because of her sacrifice, which was 5 p.m. on a Saturday evening. And she had three young children herself. So she had left her children. Um, and she had met, uh, gone to all that trouble, made all the effort, and spent a couple of hours with me, helping me settle my family back in. That's a, that's a friend who sacrifices. Um, so if, as Adam mentioned last week, friendships, to develop friendships probably takes three key things. Time presence, and vulnerability. And it's the same with our relationship with the Lord. When we are looking to build our relationship with Him, we need time with Him, time in His presence. Um, we need to pay attention when we are with Him. We need to listen to what He has to say to us. And we also need to be honest and vulnerable before Him. I mean, He knows everything anyway, so there's no point trying to hide it. So, um, and, and he loves us already. So, so be, a chance to being honest and vulnerable with him um, is, is so good for us and, and helps develop our relationship with him. Um, so just to go into a bit more detail now on each of those three, time, I think all of us would agree and understand that to develop friendships takes time. It takes intentionality and perseverance. And we have to spend time with people to really get to know them. And if we want to develop a close friendship, we have to spend a lot of time with people to really get to know them and to be able to trust them. Um, but our time is limited. So we have to make these choices 
carefully and prayerfully because we can't be best friends with everybody. Um, one thing um, we always did with our children growing up was when we were doing the, the parties, you know, you go to that stage where there's hundreds of parties that you have to attend, but we always made a point of um, planning um, to make, we made, I always contacted the moms of the best friends to make sure that they could get there on that date. Because as long as the best friends were there, it didn't, ever, whoever else came along just you know, made up the, the party fun. But um, the best friends were the key. Um, and I think it's the same now even as we're older. We need to prioritize being there for our best friends. We can't always be there for everybody, but we definitely want to make sure that we prioritize a date with our best friends and our closest friends. Then the next one is presence. Um, I'm smiling because I know it's coming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I'm looking at the person. Um, so um, being present and having focused attention is really important. Um, so there's a famous story in our family um, that involves somebody here who I'm trying not to mention their name. Um, but I was, we were newly married. Um, <laughs> newly married 20 years ago. And um, we were in, living in Johannesburg, and my family was all from Cape Town. And so my sister, um, who's a few years younger than me, flew up now, very excited to come and, and um, stay with her new brother-in-law and her sister. So, um, so she flew up. It was all very exciting. And the next morning, we went out for coffee to the Mug and Bean coffee shop. And, um, and we sat down, and my sister and I are very similar. We love quality time. We love good conversation. And we sat down, and um, Paolo, <laughs> um, um, this person leaned in, <laughs> leaned in with, um, and said, so, Sarah Jane, how are you really? And I was like, oh, you see, this is why I married him. What a, what a nice, kind, thoughtful guy. And my sister leaned back in, and she started what was, we were, her and I were expecting to be at least a 10 to 15 minute sort of, you know, monologue of how she really was. And, and I leaned in, and she got to about the second sentence, and uh, this person, my husband, um, leaned back, looked over and noticed a newspaper, and picked up the newspaper and started reading it on the second or third sentence. I mean, we were, we were absolutely horrified. We both screamed his name at the top of our lungs, and he got such a fright, he hadn't even realized he had zoned out. <laughs> um, which he is now regularly reminded of. Um, but let's just say he has learned a lot over the years about listening. <laughs> um, but the truth is that distraction is the enemy of presence, and we pick up straight away when somebody is not focused on us. And, um, you know, they've even done studies to say that even just having your phone on the table makes somebody feel that you're not entirely um, focused on them. And so, you know, uh, it's really important that when we are with somebody, we really are present. Um, we, we just did an excellent uh, listening workshop um, that was run by uh, Heather, Leslie, and, and Tanya last week. If you need any, need any help in that area... Um, but yeah, and then one quick tip is now 20 years married. What, what I say now to my husband is because, you know, in married life, there's all times of, you know, busyness, isn't there? And so if I'm wanting him, I will say to him, um, tell me when you've got 10 minutes to focus on me because I've got something I want to tell you. So that's one way of dealing with it. Another thing we do in our family is we have dinner together every night and we're not allowed any media at the table. This is also for certain members of the family more than others, but it helps us as a family to learn how to connect and actually have meaningful conversations with one another and, and give each other prioritized, focused time together. Um, right, the third point is vulnerability. Uh, we cannot expect to have really close friends without a level of intimacy, which comes from being open and vulnerable with one another. You know, the closer a friend is, the more open and vulnerable we have to be with that person. And um, obviously, we need to exercise wisdom. We don't just start, you know, telling our deepest secrets to everybody we meet. But as we build trust, as we get to know someone, we believe that they're a safe person, they're trustworthy, and that's someone we're building a, a relationship with, we, we slowly start to reveal more about ourselves and share more about ourselves. And I'll come back to this point um, a little later. But right now, um, I'm going to start at the beginning, which is making friends. 
um, as somebody who's had to move around the world quite a few times, um, I wouldn't have said this was a skill, but I've had to learn to make friends. Um, and Bob Berg says, the single greatest people skill is a highly developed and authentic interest in the other person. So to be able to make new friends, we have to have an interest in other people. We need to be able to be intentional about making use of and creating opportunities to meet people. And we've also got to be willing to be brave and say hello to people. So making use of opportunities to meet people could mean things like coming early to church for the tea and coffee at 10 o'clock. Or it could mean having a chat to somebody at the school gate or on the side of the football pitch. Um, or, or it could mean uh, joining some kind of volunteer activity. Or, just a quick reminder, a midweek group, <laughs> which opens in a week. Um, and, but those are all great opportunities to get to know people. Like if you're on a serving team at church, it's such an easy way just to say hello. You've got something you can talk about. Oh, where do these banners go? Oh, yes, and how are you? How was your week? And so it's an easy way to start to just get to know people a little bit and just put a few feelers out, see who you start chatting to, who you start connecting with. Um, but um, I'm actually quite an introvert, and so I can tell you it's so much easier for me to stand up here and speak than it is to go into the foyer and have coffee and try and say hello to someone. You may not believe it, but that it's true. So, so I have had to, so I I've learned to talk myself through these situations, which might sound now a little bit lame, but here we go. So before the event, I, I, I breathe, because I've been to counseling, and <laughs> so I breathe. <laughs> And I picture the event, and I remind myself that everybody feels shy and awkward, but somebody has to be brave and make the first move. And then in my head, I go, this is what you're going to say, Liz. It's going to be fine. You're going to walk up to someone, and you're going to go, hi, hello, morning. And then you're going to say, like if you're at the, and then I have one or two lines that I'm going to say, how was your week? Or how was the summer? Or you know, something lame, like if you're at the football pitch, oh my goodness, haven't they got even bigger over the summer? What is happening to our boys? Um, or, or, or one of my favorites, um, I really need this caffeine this morning, and then see what the other person says. I have these lines ready, sorry if I've used them on you. <laughs> and then I find once I get started, the conversation flows, and then, it's, then I'm fine. It's just the beginning bit that I always feel slightly awkward in. Um, and then another really important thing is, is to remember the nonverbal communication, because actually that's, that's far bigger in, in how we communicate, isn't it? And so make sure that you're smiling, um, that you um, maintain eye contact with people, that you focus on them and give them your full attention. Um, and then ask, ask questions. You know, once you start, ask questions that can let them tell you more information about them. I'm always fascinated what I learn from other people. We were at a conference recently, and I learned all about the potato conference that happens here in November every year, which I did not know happened. Um, but Potato Dave told us that there are people that come from all over the country to Harrogate for this conference where they speak about all, potato, all things potato. Did you know? It's in November if you want to make sure you're there. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, be patient and keep sewing. You know, um, people, if, you, if somebody told you, oh, um, you know, what are you doing this week? Oh, I've actually got a job interview. The next week, try and make sure that you've asked them, how did that job interview go? Follow up the conversation. Send them a text. You want to keep building um, on that, you know, and, um, and, and then focus on the process, not on the outcome. So when we came here to the UK, I had one of my mom ideas where I thought it was a good idea to focus on um, making friends because we all had to make friends. And so I said, okay, no, we're going to have this, we're going to have a friendship tree. And every time one of us does something towards making a friendship, so maybe it's like playing with someone at break time, or maybe I speak to someone at church on a Sunday at coffee or something, then we get to put a fruit on the friendship tree. Okay, the, the tree never materialized, but we just spoke it through anyway. Um, but I found it really helpful actually for me because it helped me focus on the sowing, not on the outcome. Um, and actually, yeah, in fact, I tried to resurrect this 
post-COVID, and I, and I suggested to the kids, oh, yeah, why don't we do that again where we focus on, like, maybe we need some family friends. Wouldn't that be nice? Get a few more people in the circle. And at which point one of my children said, Mom, no offense, but us kids, our social lives are fine. It's you and Dad who need to work on yours. <laughs> yes, as I said, <laughs> very lovely children. Um, anyway, um, so stay patient and focus on the process of sowing. And then, for those of us who want to work on deepening some friendships, you know, again, this comes down to, to time and vulnerability. Um, it takes time to build up trust, to be comfortable with one another, and to start sharing um, more about our lives with each other. We need to be able to share the ups and the downs of life together. And, you know, when you're... When, when, there's the people you want to celebrate with in the high, and there's also the people who you want to be with you in the low. Um, a really low moment in my life was when my dad died, suddenly in my house, in the first thing in the morning. And with, before the, the um, medical team had even left, and um, the undertakers had arrived, there were three friends who were already there, making tea, um, comforting my mother and I. They were just there, and it was 8 a.m. On, on a weekday morning and they were there. Um, we need to have those kind of people in our lives and, and people who truly know also what's going on in our lives. And sometimes, you know, we might even feel more comfortable sharing, sharing our troubles with someone or something that's going wrong, but we don't always feel that safe sharing our dreams. And I, that for me is actually the one that tells me who I'm really closest to, is the person I'm actually willing to share some of my dreams with. Um, what are my hopes for the future? What am I praying for? Um, so, for me, the thing that has worked the best is, is to actually realize, is to actually pray with somebody. So, so 25 years ago, I, think I shared this recently, I had three friends and myself, and we, we started praying together um, every week. We, at that stage, we were praying for one of us was trying to fall pregnant, and um, the three of us were wanting to get married. Um, I was starting the Hope Factory. There was a lot going on, and we got together. We saw many, many answers to pray over those couple of years. But that praying together cemented a friendship that the four of us have maintained for 25 years. We now are in different parts of the world, but we still have our awesome foursome WhatsApp, um, which we... <laughs> Okay, we were in our 20s when we made it, um, but we still, um, any of us now could pick, would, if, if the call came through, no matter what time of day or night, we would answer it. We put in prayer requests still. We sp we're still in contact probably at least weekly between the four of us. Um, and I've had the same thing happen in different cities that I've lived in. I've managed to um, connect with somebody and pray with somebody. And last year I was thinking, you know, Lord, I haven't met someone here in Harrogate that I've started praying with. And then the Lord pointed, and I started praying for that person, and the Lord pointed someone out to me, and her and I have been meeting since, since January, and I can't tell you the blessing it has been in my life to, to be able to pray with somebody. It just takes your, your friendship to a whole other level, because you really, when you're praying with someone weekly, you're, you're sharing your heart, you're sharing the ups and the downs, aren't you? You're sharing the dreams, the things you're praying into, and, and, the, and the tough things as well. So, so go after that. It, the, the blessing... Um, that it brings to your life is so worth it. And if, you, if you're now saying to yourself, well, well um, I don't really have someone like this, um, let me just tell you a quick story. So um, a couple of weeks ago, um, 11 o'clock at night, and I was scrolling, which I know no one should be doing, scrolling on social media at 11 o'clock at night. Nothing good ever comes of that. And so my algorithm clearly thought that the highest thing to tempt me with at that time of night was to show me this advert for a new dustpan and broom. <laughs> how, how sad is my life? <laughs> so, and even worse, I sit and watch the advert and I start going, oh, doesn't that dustpan look amazing? <laughs> and so I was just amazed by it because it had this, it had like these bristles on it and the lady was was, was like cleaning the broom as she, as she swept, and then all the dust just fell into the, into the pan. I was like, oh, that is so satisfying. I have got to have this. And I went to go and purchase it for my 12 pounds, and then, luckily, the voice of reason in my head said, Liz, you don't have 12 pounds to spend on that dustpan. And so I, I repented, and 
The next morning when I went down to get my dustpan, I looked around and, and I was like, oh, I'm going to take out my little dustpan. It's not the cool one from last night. And I looked down. I had that dustpan. I just never knew it had those features. <laughs> Irene, sometimes the thing that's right in front of you, you don't see. So we need to ask the Lord. And you, there might be someone right there that you just never saw in that way. What's right in front of you that you could have missed? So, ask the Lord for friends. Pray into that. Sow into friendships and relationships. Be a good friend. Pray for your friends and love well. Wouldn't it be great if there was a friend who was always with us, who didn't get distracted and already knew everything about us, so we never had to worry about being honest? Well, the good news is that there is. And we are invited into love and friendship with God the Father, Jesus his Son, and the Holy Spirit. The truth is that even the best of our friends will let us down from time to time, but we know that God will never let us down. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and he never fails. And we are invited into that love and friendship with him. You know, um, we know that we all want to be seen, we all want to be known, and we all want to be loved. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever received a gift from someone that just really told you that they really know you. Um, so a few years ago when I was at work, that we had a custom that when you, you, you all bought your own coffee mug to the office and you used that to make your tea and coffee. And tea, as you can tell, is a really big part of my life. I, I'm at least every hour and a half, I'm making a cup of tea. And, um, and th so back in this same year where Paolo was in Dubai and I was essentially single parenting with these three kids and I was working full time and I was, um, everything else was all going on, I had very little time. And unfortunately, my, my cup got a crack in it. And, um, and, it was, and I just didn't have a chance to get to the shop to buy a new one. And um, anyway, it was just one of those things It was just... I noticed it every time I drank my tea like five times a day. And uh, I was like, oh, just got to get there, got to get there, got to get there. Anyway, I arrive at work one morning, and there's this a, a, a gift box with a new mug in it. And, and I was like, where did this come from? Anyway, it was a colleague of mine, and she said, oh, I noticed that your mug had a crack in it, and I just felt like I was meant to get you a new mug. And, but I knew that that gift was from the Lord. He, he was the only one that knew how frantic I was and that how much I love my tea and how annoyed I was by that crack in the mug. And he knew and he organized for someone to get me a new mug. And I felt so loved and so known in that moment. And, you know, we also get to have the joy of spending the rest of our lives getting to know him. Um, and, you know, Jesus said in, in um, John 14, verse 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, um, 16 and 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and will be in you. And, and that's the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is our helper, our comforter, our counselor, our advocate, and our encourager. He is our friend who is always with us, and he connects us with Jesus and the Father. So I just want to encourage you today, don't miss out on the closest friend you will ever have. Spend time getting to know the Lord through being with the Holy Spirit, being present, being honest with him, being vulnerable, and enjoy his presence. So if the, um, Hamish and Beth, if you want to come up, um, just going to end now with, um, with praying for us that we can really um, draw near to the Lord more, um, enjoy his presence, and, um, and then we're going to singing our, our, our final song. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that we get to have the privilege of spending the rest of our lives getting to know you more, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you not only sent your Son,
but you also spent the Holy Spirit so that we are never alone, but that we always have a companion and a friend who is with us, closer than a brother. Jesus, I just thank you that we get to enjoy your presence, um, that we get to enjoy time with you. Um, in the happy times and in the, and in the tough times, you are there. Thank you, Father, that you love us, that we, each one of us are precious. And I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to experience more of you and know you more. Amen.